can a laser projector last five, six, seven years? Absolutely. If well cared for, your 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 lease agreements are never going to go that long, and then you're replacing gear just to essentially replace gear because that lease is up or what buy it for a dollar that's my other favorite you buy it for a dollar and then there's nothing i don't know everybody's situation but i and i, I try not to say you're wrong people are wrong but if you lease something and then you buy it for a dollar when you're done you've made a big mistake like that that was not a smart thing to do <laughs> i'd buy that for a dollar buy versus lease zoom approval and av over ip security all that and more on EdTech. EdTech episode 112, buy for a dollar. Hello, AV friends, and welcome to another episode of EdTech. As always, we have our panel of awesome higher ed AV professionals, Ernie Bailey. How you doing, Ernie? Aaron, I'm doing just great. It's good to be back again. Absolutely. And Scott Tyner. Hi, Scott. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for having me again. And today we have a special guest joining us for this episode from Yale University, Ann Kelly. Hi, Aaron. Welcome, Ann. Go Bills. Go Bills. Absolutely. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you do over there. I uh, am new to the role. Uh, I manage the events here in both the uh, academic and classroom and special event spaces for the Yale School of Medicine. So we are strictly mostly upper division. Um, it, very historical spaces. Um, people do take photos of in front of our buildings all the time. So it, it's great to be here in something as established and you're going 300 years at least on some of these spaces. So it's amazing. That's awesome. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And also, um, and was one of the Hetma Prism Scholarship winners last year. And congratulations on getting your CTS at Infocom. Yeah, it was wonderful. And and the Prism support was, uh, it was a year long process. Uh, we had uh, cohort um, study sessions. Uh, we had a mentor, because um, it was very, I, I was very fearful about taking it and failing it right out of the bat. So we had um, a great process to study and just get all that out. And I walked in, took it past first time. Uh, I, to this day, I, I am thankful for that opportunity to just be able to have the group. The group was fabulous. Awesome, yay. Little- Little applause. <laughs> little ad for, uh, for the Hatmas PRISM Scholarship, which um, will be uh, probably putting out applications for our next cohort um coming up relatively soon yeah but yeah so let's jump into our first article that we read for today this one comes to us uh on ravepubs.com written by scott tyner uh higher ed lease versus buy so lease lease or buy where do you all stand on this scott uh touch on stuff I think we've probably talked about on here before, but uh, I agree, you know, uh, with I think everything he said in here, you know, that while there are advantages to lease, it does kind of put you in a bind budget wise. Uh, you know, the life cycle uh, perspective, as he puts it, uh, is probably the one thing that uh, the lease program has going for it, but it does lock you in. Uh, you know, life cycle has been a big favorite subject of mine for many years. I've, I've given talks on it and how, how do you maintain it? When I first started in the industry, we our budget process was you went until a system failed and then you went and begged for money uh, to replace that system. And that's just not sustainable. Uh, and, you know, we, when we first started looking at it, we did look at leasing, but I think the points that Scott brought out, you know, with locking you in and lock, you know, one to a multi-year contract with our university does not like doing it all, uh, as well as locking you in on several projects or products. Uh, that may or may not be what you need. And I, you know, when I, as I was reading through this and his mentions about, you know, how COVID affected budgets and stuff, I also got to thinking, what if you entered into a five or seven year lease in 2019? And our classroom experience completely changed in 2020. We went from all in room to all Zoom, and now we're hybrid. 
And if we had been locked in in all of those classrooms, I don't know how we would have survived. Yeah, I mean, when I was writing about it, I, I actually, I mean, I think that it, it's a financial tool one way or another, what, whatever you decide to do. it. Two, the two, the one thing that really frustrates me, maybe I didn't quite explain this quite well in the article, is it drives me nuts when any vendor, any salesperson comes and tells you that they've got the greatest thing in the world and, and you have to be doing this and kind of, aren't you an idiot if you're not leasing? Like, yeah. let let me talk to somebody who really understands this if you don't if you don't think this is a good idea and it's it's like no no i i understand it i'm telling you here's where it doesn't exactly work for me um and i think that there are places uh that leasing might make sense i know lots of uh colleges do leases of laptop computers let's say that really i think have a more defined life cycle replacement needs than a classroom. As I wrote in the article, I think most of us, for most of our classrooms, hopefully they've been maintained well enough, that even during the COVID years, we could have said, no, we can go a year. We can go a year without pretty much doing anything. We can do some basic. And I don't, I don't know that with laptop computers, you'd ever want to get into that role where you went, no, for a full year, we're not going to do anything. So it's just, it, to me, it's just about knowing what your strategy in your school is, knowing how your finance department likes to do it, and not having somebody who literally doesn't even ask a question come in and tell you the best way to do something. It does, like when you look at small versus very large institutions, and before where I am now, I was at a school that was less than 4,000 students, and, and it, you might not have the depth of skill in a, in a crew to maintain certain things. So where you might have a CIO go, well, let's just leave so then we don't have to worry about it. Um, it's it kind of is, it's a band-aid for not being you know not having the depth of staff and it seems like such a, a great answer but in the long run what are they paying for five to seven years from now whereas establish your infrastructure and establish the people and you you know you your whole process will be completely different and it, you kind of wear Wait, who's the doing the buying? And that really probably answers more of where to lease or where to buy. And I, I've sat in both chairs and, and fought to know your, know your stuff, know your gear, know your brands, and also know how to work a sales rep. <laughs> so like, no, that's not, that is not, not a good, not, that's not good. And yeah, COVID was great. Nothing turned on for two years practically. So you feel bad for those who kept paying leases for gear that they weren't using collecting dust. Yeah, we lease um, copiers and printers, or at least the high high Oops, performance yeah. ones. But that comes with, you know, a specific contract, and it usually comes with a service person who, you know, the, right. the SLA is very, you know, clearly written out. There's a certain amount of maintenance that's done. Like if you had hundred plus classrooms that also included regular maintenance and stuff like that, like if it was essentially like leasing a car, like you get free oil changes at the dealership. Like some of those things could be worth it, especially if you have a smaller campus with a smaller team, you know, so some of those AV as a service thing could be taken it care works. of. Right. Like changing your filters every six months, someone going to tapping them out, change, putting in new ones, whatever. Those things can eat up so much time for the manager trying to also do other things that, that's helpful, but you know, can a laser projector last five, six, seven years? Absolutely, if well cared for, your 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 lease agreements are never going to go that long, and then you're replacing gear just to essentially replace gear because that lease is up. So, or what? Buy it for a dollar. That's my other favorite. You buy it yeah. for a dollar, and then there's nothing. I, I, right. I mean, well, that's the one. I, yeah. That's the one case where I would say I I I don't know. I don't know everybody's situation, but I, and I, I try not to say you're wrong, people are wrong, but if you lease something and then you buy it for a dollar when you're done, you've made a big mistake. Like that, that was not a smart thing to do. You, you've proven the point that leasing is bad, but Aaron, I, I think that the idea of printers, we do the same thing with printers, right? Cause we did the math to say hiring and training a person who's going to come and fix all our printers and copiers on campus. We can't keep them busy enough. We can't keep somebody on. We can't it made sense to lease in the case, like you said, where yeah. uh, uh, this, uh, 
toner and the like are, are part of it. Um, delivery, installation, support, all part of that lease. And like Ann said, if you're in a small enough school and you can do that with your AV, okay, maybe that works. Um, but that does start getting to AV as a service as opposed to simple, just I'm financing with an institution and paying it over four years. So this next one is from mytechdecisions.com. Crestron unveils new Zoom enterprise solutions at Zoomtopia. Um, so yeah, uh, it's always seems like interesting things come out of out of, out of Zoomtopia each year, um, and you know, for those schools that actually are Zoom campuses, um, it could have a pretty decent impact. But I found it, you know, it's it's kind of some of the things that you know Crestron has been doing with making sure that the stuff is certified with Zoom um, is pretty interesting. Um, what um, what do you all think? I think honestly, it's all of those things that that bar the seventy um, the model numbers escaping me right now. Um, it I can do all those things already with other things. I mean, it's, it's, if that's the first time, and I, I haven't, it's been a few years since I've been researching Crestron support gear. So um, if that's brand new offering with those features, uh, backend features, room scheduling, what have you, um, th that's, we've been doing that with other things already for a couple of years. So um, yeah, I, is, is it, are they catching up? I don't, I don't. I kind of feel the same way and I don't like being locked in. And when Crestron releases these products, they lock them where it's only usable for Zoom. It's only usable with other Crestron gear and stuff like that. We like building our own. And we, while we do use Zoom for our academic programs, the administrative side uses Teams our, and our healthcare side uses other tools that are all uh, HIPAA compliant. And I need my rooms to be agnostic. You can walk in, you can click on a button for Zoom, for Teams, for WebEx, or whatever else they're using. There's those buttons on the touch screen, and the gear doesn't care which one it's connected to. Uh, so, I mean, if you're, yes, if you're building out dedicated Zoom rooms, and I've got a meeting coming up in a week or two to listen to Zoom, try to sell me Zoom rooms again. Uh, I, I agree to listen to that once or twice a year, but uh, we're still, like I said, we've got to be agnostic in our rooms as far as what platform we're running. Uh, but if you are doing Zoom rooms and you're back to minimal staff and needing, you know, as, ha have to do as little support as possible, these are usually good packages. But if you're needing to go work outside the box that, that, uh, Zoom and or Crestron have built, you're, this is, I think, a waste of money. Uh, but, you know, if, if they do release these products without the lockdown part, I, we would definitely look at them. We like Crestron gear most of the time. It, it's interesting because I, I, like both of you, don't, I, the, the Zoom approved that this doesn't, it's like, I don't know, I, it doesn't really matter to me. I actually found it much more interesting on the Zoom phone appliance they talked about because we're a Zoom, we do Zoom phone hmm. to know that there's a phone that I can give to somebody that will work with Zoom phone. That's different to me or the yes. scheduling panel to know that the scheduling panel works with my scheduling system. Cause I mean, I, I don't know. It's like Zoom, like pretty much everything works with Zoom video, right? Like I don't. Yeah. That's why you use Zoom, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know the whole Zoom approval of a, of a, of the camera video bar. It's just like, I, I don't know. I don't know why that's important. I miss the Zoomtopia from 2019. If you look at the guest list from that Zoomtopia, whoo, I'm a Snoop Dogg. <laughs> we should. I, I, that, that was amazing. I missed, I missed the whole announcement for the Zoomtopia this year. Yeah. I think the approval of equipment by Zoom, um, uh, there, uh, I know it does seem a little bit, a bit much. Cause you're like, I know it works. Like, do I need that? Like extra little, little kiss of approval there. Um, but I can see how to some, some schools or some, 
you know, corporations where that may seem like that the guarantee that this is going to work reliably with, you know, what they, you know, with their, their systems. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you guys. Yeah. For someone just starting out and they're maybe not an AV professional or they've never set up a Zoom room, everything is in the box. I mean, down to the cables and cable ties, you need to put it all together. But if you, like I said, if you, if you know what you're doing and you want some flexibility that you've lost that when you buy these packages. It's a great point, right? The, the, the smaller schools, right? The ones that can't afford a lot of staff, kind of like what Ernie was just saying is maybe that is great for them because they have that confidence behind them of this. They say this works. The other one that's interesting is I don't know about this, this particular device, but you can buy some of this stuff on CDW or B and H now. And so for, for those people having a zoom, uh, zoom approval or zoom certified might make sense. Right. Uh, community college and stuff like that, that, you know, are working on a shoestring budget. You know, if you can get this, follow the instructions, you've got a working zoom room in a day or so. Right. So whoever's adminning that thing in the background doesn't have to now learn 50,000 other tools. Cause it, it'll look just like your computer or your laptop. It, those high, it's not a new skill. It just is. I'm also wondering now that I think about it, if the approval also potentially comes with some kind of like guarantee, not, not guarantee, but some sort of kind of agreement from zoom that, Hey, when we do our updates, you're going to be in the loop so right. that we're not going to do an update that your equipment's not going to work with. <laughs> And yeah. everything is going to break. So I'm wondering if maybe that could be an element mm -hmm. too, because if that's part of it, then that could be much more of a valuable thing to know that when a Zoom update happens, my systems aren't going to break. Yeah. Between 512 and 516, very approving ground for yeah. how much things were connected here. All righty. So this last one is from AV Magazine. ZV enhances security in upgrade of AV over IP platform. Um, security, gotta love it. <laughs> what is the impact of, of this? If you don't already have some of those things already set up, then what, what it, how, how are you setting up your systems? Is it a wild west show with who has access? I, I, I it, most of what I have experienced, most of what I've ever built, my network folks, firewall, you name it. I mean, anybody that works with any medical, anything has to have these things already situated and built in before you can even put up an x-ray. So I, I, for me, it's like, oh, okay, just maybe it simplifies it for the network admin on the other end. I was like, you know, reading into that, that, you know, the, the sign on and the admin approvals and, and, and lockouts and whatnot. Like sure. That might make the process faster for a situation, like a, a you know, breakdown in something, a, a, a IP decides to, a, you know, a switch decides to freeze or something goes wrong, but that that's different. That's just everyday overuse maybe, but you know, it's, a, we, I've been dealing with that forever, but I, school I came from, PA, PT, athletic training, you name it, all very HIPAA approval. I'm in a situation where that HIPAA approval is even deeper. So you can't even talk about it unless it's network approved. Like then the network folks get their hands on it and say, sure, go ahead. Right. So. Anytime we're looking at a piece of gear, network security is involved in the conversation. Yeah. You know, yeah. just we, we learned that the hard way one, the first time. And they're really easy to work with if they're, they're the, at the beginning. And they'll help us work through and they'll ask questions of the manufacturer that we wouldn't know to ask or wouldn't understand the answer to. And they get it and they say, okay. And they work with us on how to implement it so we can use it or tell us that I think you can find a better product out there. I've had that happen a time or two. So, yeah, it's like, it's great, but <laughs> yeah, I think that it, it shows these, a that the AV manufacturers are truly recognizing that, the products that they put out and that we use are potentially security risks or security holes. And they're actually trying to 
follow some of the more standard IT procedures that you see in, in software that's provided through an, an IT department. So I, is it, I don't think there's anything here that's a, a game changer, but it, it's continuing to recognize that stuff that we used to think, oh, it's just the AV system, come on, who cares about that? We now recognize that any, any hole to your network is a problem, or any place that people can get private data is a problem. And so I think it's great to see them doing this and, and kind of following some of those IT standards. Absolutely. And hopefully it kind of um, sends a signal to the other manufacturers out there that these are considerations that should be made um, since security is, is it these days. This was a fantastic episode, as always. And I want to thank very, very much Ann Kelly for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. If um, anyone wants to reach out to you, how would they go about doing that, Ann? Uh, Ann Kelly 9, A N N dot K E L L. Um, excuse me. Yeah. A N N dot K E L L at Yale dot edu is my educational uh, email. Uh, easiest to get a hold of me, and also um, on the HEMA page, uh, you can find me there as a member of HEMA. Uh, if uh, that's pretty much it for for the educational side. Fantastic. And Ernie, how can people reach out to you? LinkedIn is the best way to find me, I believe. All righty. And Scott, how about you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, and you can find me. At- Aaron reminded me recently, it's not Twitter anymore. You can find me on X. Uh, it's doesn't, that just doesn't roll off the tongue. I don't know. S Tyner. And then, uh, on, on Ray pubs as well. Fantastic. And as for myself, you can find me on X at smearing underscore off underscore ice on LinkedIn, on the Hetma community, and you can catch me here once a month on the ed tech podcast. So, um, See you next time. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation.